Warm welcome back then after the um, week's break. We're going to be looking today at uh, the Exodus. Um, before we do that, can I just um, welcome a friend of John McLeod's um, and his wife, uh, John, I can't remember his name from it's, South it's India. John, yeah, John Jabba. Yeah. Hello. 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 And John, and John has a ministry of prayer and healing amongst the Hindus in um, South India. Yes. Yeah. I think you've got a meeting tomorrow night? Tomorrow night yeah, at 7.30 in the East Church and the East Church of Scotland in Muraford. Okay. If anyone is interested in that. So good to have you with us, uh, John. Okay, let's uh, let's begin with with uh, a word of prayer. <clears throat> our God and Father, as we turn our attention to the scriptures that speak of that great redemptive work at the very heart of the Old Testament, uh, the mighty Exodus. Uh, that you brought about for your ancient people. Uh, we thank you, Father, that uh, in it we see something of the, the great work that uh, it points forward to on the cross of Calvary and the exodus that Jesus Christ has brought about for us and for his people, for your people from every <coughs> nation under heaven. So, Father, as we come to your word, we ask that you would uh, quicken our minds and quicken our hearts, keep us attentive, keep us fixed on yourself, open up our minds and hearts to all that you reveal to us through the scriptures, and uh, open up our hearts to that we can receive that, that we can accept that, Father, by faith and trust you, and see it's implications for our own lives as well. Hear us now through Christ our Lord we ask it. Amen. Amen. <coughs> uh, we're going to, I'd like us to read just a, a, a few passages to begin with. Uh, there are passages that we will come back to various points through this hour that uh, highlight for us something of what the Exodus is about. Now, first of these is just towards the end of chapter 2 of the book of Exodus. Exodus chapter 2 from verse 23. <coughs> uh, during that long period, the king of Egypt died. The Israelites groaned in their slavery and cried out, and their cry for help cause of their slavery went up to God. God heard their groaning and he remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac and with Jacob. So God looked on the Israelites and was concerned about them. And just if you let your eyes slip down a few uh, verses to chapter 3 verse 7 uh, where we have uh, similar things expressed. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites. Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now go, I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. 
And again, another short passage in chapter 6. Chapter 6 from verse 6. Therefore say to the Israelites, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. I will free you from being slaves to them, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with mighty acts of judgment. I will take you as my own people, and I will be your God. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God, who brought you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians, and I will bring you to the land I swore with uplifted hand to give to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. I will give it to you as a possession. I am the Lord. Amen. And may God bless to us his powerful word. Uh, so finally, we've uh, got out of Genesis. Um, uh, we're considering the Exodus um, today. This great saving event at the heart of the Old Testament. A saving event that really defined uh, Israel as a nation. Uh, the actual event of the Exodus itself, um, we have a record of that between chapters 12 and 14 of the book of Exodus, but almost all of the material from the beginning up unto, uh, from the beginning of the book up to chapter 18 is, is related in one way or another to the, to the Exodus. So uh, it's at the wider section that we're going to, to look today. And just take out from that some of the main emphasis. There's lots more that we could say about the Exodus um, and how it's related to other parts of the Bible as well, but uh, these are the, uh, the, the ideas on your sheet, or the headings on your sheet, are, are the main themes I want to cover today. And the first thing I, I want us to look at, and that's from the early chapters, part of which we've uh, just read, um, the early chapters of Exodus. The first thing I want us to look at is the motivation for the Exodus. Uh, what is it, why is it that the Exodus happened? What's the, the motivating factors uh, with regard to the, to the Exodus? And I want us to see that uh, the great motivation for the Exodus is in fact God's commitment already to Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. His commitment uh, in what we have come to know as the Abrahamic covenant. His covenant with, with Abraham and his descendants. So the motivation for the Exodus is the Abrahamic covenant. And God's faithfulness to the commitment that he made in that, uh, the commitments that he made in that, uh, 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 the passionate commitments that he made in that covenant, uh, not only to Abraham, but to the seed of Abraham, to the offspring, to the generations that would follow on from him. Next week, uh, God willing, we'll, we'll, we'll pay a little more attention to the covenant uh, that God enters into with the Israelites at Mount Sinai that we read of uh, particularly from uh, chapter 19 onwards. First, uh, a reference to that new covenant uh, at uh, Mount Sinai is to be found in Exodus chapter 19 and verse 5. Uh, but that's not the first time the covenant word is found in the book of Exodus. Uh, it's found on three occasions in the early chapters, and I think I've got them listed for you there under the, the first bullet point. Chapter 2, verse 24, chapter 6, verse 4, chapter 6, verse 5. And on each of these occasions, uh, the word covenant in these verses, it's not referring forward, it's not pointing forward to the covenant that God is going to enter into with Israel at Mount Sinai. It's actually... Uh, pointing us back to the book of Genesis and pointing us back to the covenant that God had made with Abraham. So chapter 2, verse 24, God heard their groaning. That's the groaning of the children of Israel under the, uh, the oppressive weight of slavery and the, uh, the affliction they were experiencing in Egypt. God heard their groaning and he remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac and with Jacob. So God looked on the Israelites and was concerned about them. 
and again in chapter 6 from verse 3 onwards in that part that we've uh, already read God is speaking to Moses there at the time of his call uh, at the burning bush uh, and he says I appeared in the past to Abraham Isaac and Jacob I also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan verse 5 moreover I have heard the groaning of the Israelites whom the Egyptians are enslaving and I have remembered my covenant so God is remembering his covenant. And therefore he says in verse 6, Say to the Israelites, I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. It's because of the covenant with Abraham that he remembers at this point that he then uh, goes on to redeem, uh, to save, to liberate uh, the Israelites. So it's, it's clear from these verses that uh, the Exodus was initiated by God as a result of God's prior commitment in the covenant to Abraham and his seed, his, the generations coming after him. The uh, Exodus happened at one level because God remembered his earlier covenant. He remembered his covenant. Uh, you may recall from our studies a few weeks ago when we were looking at the Noah story uh, that we read um, for the first time in, in the Bible of God remembering. Uh, Genesis 8 and verse 1, God remembered Noah. And we saw then that what that meant was that he didn't just recall um, something he had forgotten, but when the Bible talks about God remembering, it means that he goes into action on behalf of the person or situation that he remembers. So when we read here that God remembered his covenant with Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, that means he goes, he goes into action on the basis of the covenant. And in fact, in order to press the promises of the covenant forward towards their fulfillment. Now these covenant promises made by God to Abraham and his descendants, we saw the last time, they can be summed up under three main umbrella heads. There's the promise of posterity. Uh, whether you think of that as simply a son for Abraham or whether you think of it as uh, the generations uh, to come from him, the great nation that's going to come from him, the, uh, the many nations that he will be a father of. Uh, we can think of it under the title pos posterity. Then there's uh, secondly relationship with God, and thirdly the promise of land. And the, the the promise of posterity, the promise of seed or offspring or descendants uh, for Abraham, actually comes really to a fulfilment uh, in Exodus chapter one. And much of Exodus chapter 1 is about the, the wonderful way in which that promise of God to Abraham was actually fulfilled against all the odds. And in fact, uh, despite horrendous opposition from Pharaoh and his plots and plans and so on. Uh, the opening verses of, of Exodus summarize for us the situation that we were left with at the, at the end of Genesis. Uh, Exodus chapter 1 and verse 5 really summarizes for us the end of Genesis. Uh, in Genesis 46 and 27, we learn that the descendants of Jacob numbered 70 in all. And that's what's picked up here in Exodus 1 and verse 5. But in the intervening 400 years, and we need to remember that between the end of Genesis and the beginning of Exodus, 400 years have passed, according to Genesis 15 uh, and verse 13. In that intervening uh, 400 years, according to Exodus chapter 1 and verse 7, the Israelites were fruitful and multiplied greatly and became exceedingly numerous, so that the land was filled with them. Now, at one level, that's a fulfillment of the promise that God had given uh, to Abraham. A promise of seed, of offspring, of descendants, as numerous as the stars in the night sky or as the dust of the earth with a, a, a dust storm uh, passing through as it often did in the Middle East or 
uh, as numerous as the sand, the grains of sand on the, on the seashore. Uh, so it's in fulfillment of that that uh, uh, this has happened, Exodus 1 and verse 7. But it's also actually a fulfillment of God's creation blessing. Genesis 1 and verse 28. Um, God blessed uh, human beings, said be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Well, here we read that uh, the Israelites were fruitful and multiplied greatly so that the land and Hebrew, the Hebrew for land is the same as Hebrew for earth. So the, the land... Uh, or the earth, uh, the land was filled with them. Here, of course, it's the land of Egypt. Uh, so there's a fulfillment of uh, the covenant promise, but a fulfillment of the creation blessing as well, right back in Genesis 1 and verse uh, 28. Uh, and that situation of numerous uh, descendants for Abraham, uh, it continued as we see throughout Exodus chapter 1, despite all the efforts of the Pharaoh of Egypt to contain the numbers of the Israelites. And uh, you see his various plans there. I've got them noted down, verses, um, verses 11 and 12, 13 and 14, 16 and verse uh, 22 as well. Uh, last time I, I, I was here, I, I mentioned... One of the ways in which we have to read uh, certainly the first five books of the Old Testament and probably the whole of the Old Testament um, is in terms of the promises given in that key passage in the opening verses of Genesis 12. Any time you're reading anything in Genesis or Exodus uh, or Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, go back and ask yourself the question, how is this related to the promise? And see how it's uh, related to the promise. And when, we were, when I was mentioning that uh, a couple of weeks back, um, I, remen I mentioned that uh, quite a number of the stories that we read about in Genesis and Exodus and so on, it's about the obstacles that stand in the way uh, of the fulfillment of the promise, or a particular element of the promise. Sometimes these obstacles are in nature, famine, for example, um, but often these obstacles are within God's own people. Fear of Abraham, unbelief, the patriarchs. Uh, but sometimes the obstacles are opposition from the outside. And that's what we see in Exodus chapter 1. Outright opposition. Pharaoh doesn't realize it when he's trying to contain the numbers of the Israelites. Uh, but he's actually working against the purposes of God. He's working against the purposes of God in creation. And he's working against the purposes of God in redemption. And uh, perhaps that working against the promises of God just comes into my mind. Uh, we have to think about what we're doing um, when we abort fetuses. Is that not working against the purposes of God in creation? Genesis 1, 28. Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, fill, fill the land. But that's what the Pharaoh is doing here. He doesn't realize it. Uh, but his plans are, are actually set him against the creation purposes of God and the redemption promises uh, of God. But all his uh, opposition, all his plans come to nothing. Um, they are no obstacles to God. They look, brought a lot of pain and suffering, of course, to God's people. Uh, but they didn't ultimately stop the purposes of God. And the upshot of it is in Exodus 1 and verse 12, the more they were oppressed, the more they actually multiplied and spread. So that eventually, by the time of the Exodus, uh, the Israelites were nation-sized, in, at least in terms of population. Exodus 12, verse 37, the Israelites were about 600,000 men on foot, besides women and children. A modern day example of this, I think, uh, in this past century. It's happened in a much shorter period of time than the 400 years in which ex Israel expanded from 70 to 600,000 or 
Um, 600,000 were just, just the men, a couple of million. Um, the example in our own day is, of course, China, particularly since the, the Cultural Revolution. And all despite the determined policies and efforts of the, the Communist Party to destroy the Christian Church completely, um, God has caused it to grow quite phenomenally. And he sits in heaven and laughs at governments that don't believe in a God who can do that. So the promise of, uh, the promise of posterity is fulfilled by the end of Exodus chapter 1. The promise of relationship with God, uh, we, see it taking, we will see it hopefully next week, God willing, uh, take a step forward when God enters into a particular covenant with Israel at Mount Sinai. But we already have uh, an indication of that, uh, of what's coming in that covenant in uh, one of the passages we read from chapter 6 and verse 7. Where God says, I will take you as my people and I will be your God. That's the covenant with Israel. My people, your God. I am yours, you are mine. In the Abrahamic covenant, the emphasis is only on one side of that. It's on uh, the divine side of the covenant. Genesis 17, I will be your God. Uh, or their God with regard to your, um, Abraham's descendants. I will be your God. So in Genesis, that's the side of the relationship that's to the fore. I'm your God. It's only as we come to Sinai that we get the other side of the relationship. Uh, God is not only the God of Israel, but Israel is going to be the people of God. So from the very beginning, as God breaks into Abraham's life, God commits himself to be the God of Abraham and all the generations that come from Abraham. Uh, it's only at Mount Sinai that uh, we have the other side of the covenant relationship highlighted that Israel is making a commitment to be the people of God the Israel of God God is the God of Israel but Israel is to be the Israel of God with all that's implied in that and uh, we'll maybe see something of that next week God willing that's the promise of relationship and then there's the promise of land and from one perspective, of course, the land is the goal of the Exodus. What's the Exodus all about? Well, at this point, let's just say it's about, it's about getting to the promised land, which is a kind of new Eden. It's described certainly in the book of Deuteronomy and, uh, and some of the other books of, the, uh, books of Moses as, as, um, as a kind of new Eden. Uh, so... Adam, humanity in Adam is driven out from Eden and God in his redemptive purposes is taking the seed of Abraham into a new Eden. Uh, a land flowing with milk and honey, a land of pools and rivers and waters and, uh, and all of that. Um, and in Exodus 6 verse 8 we have something of, of, of that. I will bring you into the land I swore with uplifted hand. So at the time of the Exodus, uh, God is moving in power to release his people so that they can start a journey that will bring them to the promised land. So the motivation for the Exodus is the Abrahamic covenant and God's faithfulness to his covenant and to his promises there. And I think we'll see in, in a future week, God willing again, uh, at a later time in um, Israel's history, at the time of the exile, when um, the people of the southern kingdom of, of Judah uh, are sent into exile in Babylon, uh, as the prophets face that darkness uh, and wonder what hope there is for, for, the, uh, for Israel, or the, the remnant of Israel, uh, they come back to the Abrahamic covenant as the basis for their hope. 
Just as the Abrahamic covenant is what gave them hope that they would reach the promised land, so when they're scattered to the ends of the earth again in exile, what gives them the hope that they're going to reach the promised land again is the same promise. Because God had promised. Uh, Unconditionally he had promised. So uh, we'll maybe see that um, in, in a future week. Okay, that's, that's the, the, the first heading there, the motivation for the, for the Exodus, the Abrahamic Covenant. Is there anything there that anyone wants to pick up, comment on? No? Okay, if not, uh, let's go on secondly to the, <coughs> what I've called the, the nature of the, of the Exodus. Um, so we're looking at what was the Exodus? What kind of event was it? And um, the way I want us to look at this is, is in terms of some of the, the, um, the words that God uses to uh, describe the Exodus. So some of the main, main verbs. And three of them in particular that we find in in Exodus chapter 6 and verse uh, 6. So what was, what kind of event was uh, the Exodus? Well, it was, first of all, it was was a God-enabled departure. One of the main ways in which the Exodus uh, is described here and throughout the Bible is in terms of a, of a departure, a departure from Egypt. So Exodus 6 verse 6, I am the Lord and I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. And that word or that phrase, I will bring you out, uh, it's literally in Hebrew, I will cause you to go out. I will cause you to depart from under the yoke of the Egyptians. <clears throat> Our English word Exodus is actually a Latin word. It's straight. It is the Latin. Uh, the Latin title for ex- the book of Exodus in the Vulgate is Exodus. Um, so it's a Latin word, but it's the Latin itself has come from Greek. Uh, and the only difference in the Greek is that instead of US at the end, you have OS. Uh, and that Greek word is made up of two other smaller Greek words, ex, out of. You still have that in exit and so on. Out of. Uh, and hodos, uh, hodos is away. So ex hodos is a way out from. An exodus is a way out from something or a way out from uh, a place. So it's a departure, a leaving. That's what the exodus is about, uh, very basically. It's a story of the Israelites in their exodus from Egypt, their departure from Egypt, their leaving Egypt. The particular form of the Hebrew verb that's used here, however, is it's called a causative, a causative form, um, which highlights the fact that the Israelites couldn't actually leave, uh, couldn't leave Egypt themselves. No matter how much they wanted to, they couldn't do it. God had to do it for them. God had to cause it to happen. God had to bring it about. They couldn't bring it about for themselves. And of course, there's a reminder for us that nobody can save himself. Salvation is of God from beginning to end. Only God can cause uh, us to be saved. We cannot bring about our own salvation. But in Exodus 6 and verse 6 here, God promises to do exactly that very thing. Uh, And that's... uh, And in the Exodus, of course, the event, that's what he did for them. Uh, We see that summed up for us in uh, that famous summary of the Exodus that we have uh, in the chapter, uh, in chapter 20, where we read of the Ten Commandments or the Ten Words from God. I am the, that's prefaced, the commandments are prefaced by this, and hopefully we'll come back to this in another week. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt. Out of the land of slavery. God did it for them. They couldn't do it for themselves. So the Exodus is a God enabled departure. Uh, But secondly, the Exodus is uh, a liberation movement, or uh, we might say a a rescue 
mission. Um, the point of, one of the points of this departure that uh, the Lord brings about for Israel is so that they can leave behind the misery of their experience in Egypt. So that they can leave behind the oppression and the slavery uh, under the rule of Pharaoh. And that comes out again in, Gen in, in Exodus 6 and verse 6. Not only I will bring you out, uh, but then he says, I will free you from being slaves to them. And the, the Hebrew word that's used there, uh, it speaks of um, deliverance, deliverance of a people from a whole variety of different types of uh, difficult situation. It's, it's the word that's used in Genesis uh, 37 and verse 21, where Reuben, you remember one of the, the brothers of Joseph, where Reuben makes the attempt to rescue Joseph at the time when the other brothers actually want to kill him. Uh, so Reuben wants to snatch him. He rescues him from death, really, at that point. Uh, in Exodus 2 and verse 19, the same word is used of Moses coming to the aid of Ruel's daughters. Um, you know, when he meets them at the well. And uh, what Moses does there is free these uh, women from... Uh, the harassment that they were experiencing and probably, I think, implicit, uh, the molestation that they were experiencing at the hands of the shepherds. Um, so it's, it's a word that describes various situations of extrication from difficulty of one kind or another, deliverance. Most of all, in the book of Exodus, it's the word that's used of God rescuing his people from Egypt. So chapter 3 and verse 8, I have come down... This is the God, of course, who later came down in the person of Jesus and who has come down in the person of his Holy Spirit. In the Old Testament, he already talks of himself as a God who has come down. I have come down to rescue them from the hand, from the power, from the influence of the Egyptians. Or chapter 18, verse 9, uh, after the Exodus has already happened, Jethro, uh, speaking to Moses, he says, Praise be to the Lord who rescued you from the hand of the Egyptians and of Pharaoh, who rescued the people from the hand of the Egyptians. So the Exodus was a rescue mission, uh, a liberation movement. And the position or, or condition from which the Israelites were rescued or liberated was, uh, it's described mainly as one of slavery. But with that slavery was all the attendant misery that went with uh, the slavery. Particularly, uh, we read of that in the early chapters. Exodus 6 and verse 6 again. I will free you from being slaves. Exodus 20 verse 2. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. It's literally out of the house of slaves. They were slaves in Pharaoh's house. By the end of Exodus, of course, they gather at another house, which is the tabernacle, the house of God. They're still servants of God in that place, even slaves of God, but the experience is all the world of a difference. Maybe say that a bit more about that later. So the Israelites were uh, the slaves of Pharaoh, uh, and as these slaves, their lives were characterized uh, by all kinds of uh, Difficult routines of work and toil, and I've listed some of the verses uh, that you can go to there. Hard labor was a life without rest. It was a life without rest. So that's one of the things that God is doing in the, in the Exodus, is, is taking them away from that life that had no rest. So he brings them into rest. Um... But not only that, uh, it, it was a life that was full of burdens. Uh, they were given targets to meet. That's uh, all part of life nowadays, isn't it? Uh, so your Pharaoh, if you're still working, your Pharaoh is giving you targets to meet. And 
Um, for some of us, we probably feel that these are impossible targets, you know, NHS or whatever. We're struggling with uh, meeting our targets because our Pharaoh has given us impossible, the impossible burden and yoke of, uh, of our targets to meet chapter 6 and verse 7. And so they complain. They're sinking under the weight of the targets that they have to attain, that they can't attain to. And when they complain or when Moses complains on their behalf, Pharaoh just turns the screws further and makes it more difficult for them and makes the targets more unreachable. And in the middle of the process, they're physically maltreated. Uh, chapter 1, verses 13 and 14, the Egyptians used them ruth ruthlessly. The Hebrew word there uh, is violence. Uh, in other places, it's clear they were beaten. And the result of all this was that their experience is described in chapter 1 and verse 14 as bitter. And of course, uh, if you know the, the details of the Passover, uh, that bitterness of their experience was symbolized by the bitter herbs that became and still are part of the, part of the, the routine of the festival of, of Passover. Uh, other words used to describe their experience, uh, misery, pain, and so on. Uh, so eventually, they are just groaning under the weight of it all, and they cry out for help. And the wonderful thing is that God hears their cry, and God moves into action on their behalf. So chapter 2, verses 24 onwards, God heard their groaning, remembered his covenant. So God looked upon the Israelites and was concerned about them. He knew them. He knew what they were going through and was therefore committed to do something about that. Chapter 3 and verse 7, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers. I am concerned. I know about, literally, I know about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them. To bring them up out of the land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey. So the, the, the Exodus, it was a God-enabled departure, uh, but it was also a liberation movement. It was a rescue mission. Uh, it was uh, a movement that liberated the Israelites from ethnic oppression, lots of that across the world today, from a lot of, uh, liberated them from a lot of physical and mental abuse and exploitation and all of that. And even at that level, without going any uh, deeper as it were, uh, going to any deeper level or more spiritual level, uh, the Israelites were clearly intended by God to learn from their own experience uh, and apply that in their lives from this point onwards in their relationships with one another and even in their relationships to uh, non-Israelites who came among them. Uh, one uh, clear example of that is the fourth commandment. Uh, Exodus chapter 20. And, and at the heart of that commandment, of course, is, is the call for a weekly rest. And, and that is powerful against the background of a life in which they had no rest. Everyone rested under the rule of God. Uh, following the, the, Sabbath, the Sabbath rest, the Sabbath commandment. And uh, in that commandment, you'll, you'll know how, of course, the... Uh, the commandment is applied not just uh, simply to the Israelite families, to the parents and to the children in the family. Uh, it includes the servants. So from their experience of a God who had delivered them from, from uh, service where they got no rest, they were to learn that they were not to treat their servants like that. Their servants were to rest with them on a weekly basis. Even their animals, because uh, human beings from the very beginning are made to rule the earth, rule the animals of the earth, look after them. So the animals that are within our household uh, enter into the rest that we have as well. Uh, 
So the yoke came off the oxen for one day, every week, and they rested as well, and so on. But it also applies, you look closely at, at these commandments, to the alien within your gates. Not an Israelite, not circumcised, not part of the covenant, but he and she experiences rest along with you. Learn from your experience. Put the principles into operation. And in fact, when you come to the, the second articulation of the, of the, uh, the Sabbath commandment, uh, in Deuteronomy chapter 5 and verse 15, uh, the reason that's given for the command is actually the Exodus, no longer as it is in Exodus 20. It's not the creation Sabbath, but it's the, it's the, the experience of Exodus, Exodus into rest. Remember that you were slaves in Egypt, that the Lord your God brought you out of there with a mighty hand and outstretched arm. Therefore the Lord your God has commanded you to observe the Sabbath. Because you're saved from toil, brought into rest, that you're to come, uh, observe the Sabbath. So the weekly Sabbath rest was to be a, a weekly reminder to them that they were a saved people, a liberated people. And of course, later on in the prophets, Amos and so on, uh, he one of the things the Lord has against his people is that the merchants are just tapping their fingers on the Sabbath afternoon. Oh, wish this was over so that I could get some money and get to work. Um, so in their hearts, of course, they're, they're back in Egypt. <coughs> so liberation, salvation had its uh, implications for the the way the, the Israelites were to live. And today, salvation, our salvation has its implications uh, for the way we live our lives, also the way we treat others as well. Uh, and I think that's one of the reasons why as Christians and the Christian church who have experienced our own exodus <coughs> from slavery, uh, we ought to be deeply concerned for the release of slaves wherever they are across the world uh, in whatever condition they find themselves whether it's millions of dead slaves in India or tens of thousands of young girls from Asia and other uh, other areas of the world trafficked across the world today for prostitution often in the West uh, in our own country tens of thousands of children enslaved by African warlords thrown into their armies, taught to shoot when they should be playing, and all of these things. So lessons uh, that we can learn. But of course, uh, the Exodus wasn't just about um, political, social liberation. It was something much deeper than that. It was actually rescue from a life of idolatry. And it was a rescue, ultimately, from the spiritual powers that lay behind uh, Egyptian worship. Where do we see the relief from idolatry? We don't see it um, clearly, I don't think, in, in the pages of Exodus, but it becomes very clear in Ezekiel. Uh, Ezekiel chapter 20, <coughs> verses 1 to 8. And uh, there Ezekiel, uh, the Lord reminds Ezekiel of the Exodus uh, from verse 6 of that chapter, Ex uh, Ezekiel 20, verse 6. On that day I swore to them that I would bring them out of Egypt into a land I had searched out for them, a land flowing with milk and honey, the most beautiful of all lands. And I said to them, each of you get rid of the vile images you have set your eyes on. Once they saw all around them in Egypt, get rid of them. Do not defile yourselves with the idols of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. But they rebelled against me and would not listen to me. They did not get rid of the vile images they had set their eyes on, nor did they forsake the idols of Egypt. 
if, uh, as you read through the book of Exodus it, uh, itself, um, I don't think there's any specific reference made to the religious life of the, of the Israelites in Egypt. Uh, though, of course, you have the first two commandments that were given to them. Uh, these first two commandments highlight what was always going to be a problem for Israel, what proved to be a problem for Israel, what proves to be a problem for every human being, of course. Uh, our readiness, our proneness to have other gods before the living God. And if not that, then our proneness to make for ourselves idols and images which we substitute for God. Different kinds of idols and images today um, in the West. Uh, but nevertheless, idols and images that we substitute for God. So one of the intended impacts of the Exodus, um, as they were taken out of Egypt, was that they were taken away from these things that their eyes set on. They were taken away from the idolatry. They were taken away from the worship system that they had had some contact with in Egypt, they were being liberated from idolatry. And that, of course, reminds us of what happened to Abraham, liberated from idolatry. Where did the children of Abraham, the seed of Abraham, end up? Back in idolatry. Now, we bemoan the fact today that Scotland was once the land of the book. Scotland was once richly blessed in revival of power. Um, richly blessed in spiritual things. God brought us into that, out of idolatry in the past and into that. And where have we chosen to go? Well, we chose to go just where the children of the generations after Abraham were. It's always the same. It's the bias in our hearts is in that direction. And the only one who can change the bias of our hearts is the God who liberates us from that whether as individuals or families or even as, uh, as generations. But it's also, the, the Exodus is also a, a liberation from spiritual powers. And we do see that in, in Exodus, Exodus 12 and verse 12. Uh, the Exodus is, uh, and I haven't majored on this, uh, but... We've seen the principle before. Salvation is always salvation through judgment. Well, the Exodus is an act of salvation, an act of liberation, but it's through judgment. The judgments of the plagues. Uh, but it's, uh, the Exodus is not just a judgment on Egypt or the Pharaoh of Egypt. It's particularly on the, the gods of Egypt, or we might say the spiritual powers that were the inspiration for their system of idolatry. And that's, uh, we see that in Exodus 12, verse 12, but also picked up in, in the great song of victory at the end of the, uh, after the Exodus in chapter 15, verse 11. Who among the gods is like you, O Lord? Who is like you? Majestic in holiness, awesome in glory, working wonders. The Egyptians have no gods like you, Lord. Of course, it took a, a fuller, the fuller revelation of uh, the rest of the Old Testament and uh, the New Testament uh, for us to understand that behind all the false gods of Egypt and every other country lies the one whom Paul describes as the God of this world who has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the glory of Christ who is the image of God. Um, another expression, a uh, title that um, Paul in Ephesians 2 verse 2 gives uh, to Satan is the ruler of the, the kingdom of the air, the spirit now at work in those who are disobedient. Or John in 1 John 5 19 he reminds us that the whole world is under the control of the evil one. 
So today all Christians uh, are recognize, uh, rescued, we're rescued, we're liberated, not only from the power and the guilt of sin, not only from the curse of the law, we're also rescued and liberated from the greater than Pharaoh, the power of the evil one, the God of this world, a ruler of the kingdom of the air. It's a liberation movement, a rescue mission. And more briefly, it's also a redemptive activity. We see this again in Exodus 6 and verse 6. Uh, I will redeem you with an outstretched hand. I will redeem you. And that's picked up again in the Song of Moses in chapter 15, verse 13 where he refers to the Israelites as the people, Lord, that you have redeemed. Now at this point in the Old Testament, uh, the Hebrew word here that's used for redeem, uh, it seems to be almost an equivalent just for liberation or rescue. Uh, but actually when you get into the next book, the book of Leviticus, and of course everything in Leviticus happens at Mount Sinai in the wilderness just within a year of uh, the Exodus, so the Exodus is fresh in their minds. Leviticus chapter 25, uh, the verb comes to be very closely associated with two ideas, that of um, family or kinship, kinship kinsmanship. Uh, and uh, the other idea is that of uh, the cost, the redemptive cost. Uh, I'll, maybe, I'll maybe leave... Uh, these two things, um, but of course the, the full flowering of this is that our redemption comes, uh, our redemption comes ultimately through Jesus Christ. Uh, Peter, 1 Peter 1.18, not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your forefathers, but with the precious blood of Christ. A lamb without blemish or defect. Okay, that's uh, that's been a long section. Anything, anything there that um, you want to comment on the nature of the Exodus, God enabled departure, liberation movement, rescue mission, redemptive activity. No comments. We need to. Heating up completely off. <laughs> I think it probably is completely off. I don't know how relevant it is, but I'm wondering what the significance is in this um, three when after God has said to Moses, I am the Lord, I appeared to Abraham, but by my name, the Lord, I did not make myself known to them. But then further on in the chapter, he the Lord refers to himself as the Lord. So why did he not make himself known to them by the name of the Lord? Really alone. Well, <clears throat> yeah, that, I mean, that's, that's got to do with the, um, the whole issue of uh, the name that used to be translated as Jehovah, probably now is uh, more... Uh, commonly translated as Yahweh, um, so that's the background for that. We see, um, he's saying that that revelation just comes here most fully. Uh, wasn't fully revealed to the earlier generations, so not fully revealed to, to Abraham, Isaac, and and Jacob, who knew him as God, God Almighty, by a whole variety of other other names. Rather than by the name, uh, by the name Yahweh. But of course, that I mean that's another great theme that you could take out of here because it's it's uh, the name uh, Yahweh or Jehovah. It's to do with the the verb to be. I am that I am. I will be that I will be. Um, something like that. So when you get into the New Testament and the I am sayings of Jesus in the Gospels. Um, they all have this as the background. So when Jesus says, I am the true vine, he's really claiming 
I'm the God who revealed himself to Moses. Um, and before Abraham was, I am. So lots of, lots of other lots of other things that, but um, there's more I could say about that but I'd rather keep us on track it, it, it's just um, there's so much that we could look at but looking specifically at the, at the exodus uh, here any, any other comments or questions Press on a little bit further then. Uh, the goal of the Exodus. Uh, near the start today I suggested that uh, at one level the goal of the Exodus is simply the promised land. You're just thinking in terms of geography or space. Um, the promised land is the goal because God had promised. Amongst other things he had promised to give to Abraham and to seed the land. Uh, that uh, I think would be a very inadequate understanding of the Exodus. Um, right from the early chapters of the book of Exodus, there are clear indications that the goal of the Exodus is actually worship. And you get an indication of that in, in the book of Exodus uh, if you compare the beginning with the end. And that's, it's something that um, uh, it's helpful to do with a lot of the books of the, of the Bible. Always have a look at the opening chapters and have a look at the closing chapters, and uh, sometimes that shows you what's happened in between. Uh, so if you look at the opening chapters of Exodus, what what you find is a, a people in um, in slavery, in submission, in misery, uh, as the servants of or the slaves of Pharaoh. When you come to the end of the book of, of Exodus, um, they're worshiping God, and God has revealed His glory to them. Um, so in the opening chapters, they belong to the house of um, the house of Egypt, house of Pharaoh, which is a house full of slaves, uh, and it's slaves who are maltreated. By the time you come to the end of the book of Exodus, um, the people are gathered around another house, which is the dwelling place of God on earth, where God reveals His glory, and their experience is totally different uh, from them. Uh, but even before we come to the end of the book, uh, there are indications, and lots of indications in the early chapters, uh, that the Exodus is all about worship. Uh, chapter 3 and verse 12. When you have brought the people of Egypt, God's speaking to Moses, when you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. Well, I am meeting with you just now. Sinai. And that, of course, is exactly what happened, chapter 19. Or chapter 3 and verse 18, You and the elders are to go to the king of Egypt and say to him, The Lord, the God of the Hebrews, has met with us. Let us take a three-day journey into the desert to offer sacrifices to the Lord our God. Chapter 4, verse 22, Then say to Pharaoh, This is what the Lord says, Israel is my firstborn son. Let my son go that he may worship me. And there you get the kinsman redeemer idea. I didn't go into that earlier, but uh, Israel is my firstborn son. So what God is doing in the Exodus is redeeming his family. He's, uh, he's setting his family free. Um, Israel is my firstborn son. Why is the son set free? Let my son go, that he may worship me. And the word for worship there is the same word as to serve. Let my son go, so that he may, he may worship me, he may serve me, he may become my son. So Israel is the son of God, but Israel is also the servant of God. All the servants of God are sons of God, children of God. All the children of God are servants of God. Um, and their goal is to worship. So the goal of the Exodus is the worship of the one true and living God and that happens particularly first of all at Mount Sinai. Uh, we'll maybe have a, a look at that next week God willing from chapter 19 onwards uh, and from chapter 25 onwards 
where they're still based at Mount Sinai, of course, the place where they encounter, uh, encounter God and begin to worship God and offer sacrifices up to God. Uh, from chapter 25 onwards, you've got the whole of the rest of Exodus, is, almost all of it is taken up with the um, uh, details about the, um, what they require for crafting the tabernacle and uh, setting it up. Uh, and at the end, in chapter 40 and verse 34, uh, we read, The glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. So full, in fact, that Moses could not enter the tent of meeting because the cloud had settled upon it and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. So we have to think of the tabernacle as, um, if you like, as, as the means by which the worship that began at Mount Sinai in the presence of the glory of God could actually continue as they continued their journey towards the promised land. So they're taking the experience of Sinai, the going with the God of Sinai. So it's, it, it's a means by which the, the worship that they experienced there, the encounter that they had with God there could continue until they had reached uh, the promised land. And of course, once they reached the promised land, there is a sense in which uh, the climax of the, the story of Israel comes in 1 Kings uh, with the building of the temple under the, the reign of Solomon. That, that, was, that was Israel at its peak under the reigns of David and Solomon, particularly under the reign of Solomon with his building of the temple. Uh, and in a sense, that was the goal towards which they were moving in the Exodus, towards the place where they would worship God. And that's already anticipated in Moses' song in chapter 15, verse 13. When Moses says, in your unfailing love, you will lead the people you have redeemed. You're going to lead them forward. In your strength, you will guide them to your holy dwelling. Zion. To the temple. To the place where they will be able to worship. Him. Verse 17 of that same chapter. You will bring them in. That's into the promised land. You will plant them on the mountain of your inheritance. The mountain of God. The place, O Lord, you made for your dwelling, the sanctuary, O Lord, your hands established. So that's the goal towards which the Exodus is bringing God's people, or God is bringing his people in the Exodus. It's uh, to that worship in his presence. And very interestingly, the, the words, the Hebrew words that are used in the second half of Exodus uh, for the work that... Uh, the work on the tabernacle and the service of God in the tabernacle. I think I've given you a whole list of the, the verses there, you know, from 27, 19 onwards. Uh, the words that are used there are exactly the same words that are used in the opening chapters of, uh, of, of Exodus for the hard work that Pharaoh gave to his slaves to do and the Israelites as slaves. So the, what, the change that has happened in the liberation experience, in the rescue, the redemption of Israel, is all about the change of master that has taken place. They have changed their master. And it's the different character of the new master that transforms everything for Israel. The new master, of course, is the Lord. They are servants of the Lord, as Moses was a servant of the Lord. As long as they were living as servants of the Egyptians and servants of the Pharaoh, who was a, a demigod in his own day and in his own nation, uh, as long as they were uh, servants of the other gods of Egypt, life as servants of of these gods was a life of slavery, of affliction, of oppression, of misery, of a living death. L living as servants of the Lord is totally the opposite. And what makes it opposite 
is not the people of Israel. It's the God who has committed himself to Israel. To live as servants of the Lord is to live, to enter into his rest. It's to live a life of liberty. Uh, it's to live a life that is full and rich and abundant. Lots of work still to do, but it's a different experience of work and of service. A life in which they can develop to their full potential and become all that God had created them to be. And so it is with ourselves today. Uh, what happens in conversion at one level is we change masters. We change lords. No man can serve two masters. Uh, so we change masters. We change we become servants of a different Lord, and it's the Lord that we become attached to, the new Lord that we become attached to, uh, the living God, Jesus Christ, our Redeemer, and so on. He's the one who makes all the difference in our experience. So we're set free from the power of sin, we're set free from the guilt of sin, uh, we're liberated from the grasp of the strong man because Jesus is the one who has bound the strong man, Satan. But we're liberated not so that we might go and do as we please, but that we might serve a different master. We might worship the Lord and serve the Lord, love him with all our soul and mind and heart and strength and our neighbor as ourselves. Liberated to serve. Liberated to be bond slaves of Jesus Christ. But it's a wholly different experience than being a bond slave to Satan. And isn't that the way the book of Revelation indicates it will be at last in the New Jerusalem, these closing chapters of Revelation that we often go back to? Uh, the New Jerusalem seems to be a coextensive, I think, with the New Earth in that picture. But in that city, uh, John tells us that he saw no temple, no specific temple, and I think he saw no temple because it was all temple. It was all the dwelling place of God. Revelation 21 and verse 3. In that place, of course, we learn uh, from the closing chapter, verse 3, that the Lord's servants will serve him. So we're still servants. We're always servants. Servants of the Lord. His servants will serve him. Where are they when they're serving him? Well, they're sitting with him on the throne. They're reigning with him. But his servants will serve him. And he goes on to say they will see his face well, Moses had just a kind of wee bit of that, didn't he? Saw the glory of God. His face was transformed um, by the vision that he had um, of God. They will see his face and his name. His character will be on their foreheads. They're changed to be like him. Uh, we shall see him as he is. And we shall be like him. John tells us. So that's the goal of the Exodus, that's the goal of your Exodus, that's the goal of my redemption, my liberation, whatever. It's the service of God, the worship of God, in which we encounter the face of God. We will be in a position and have bodies that can cope with that uh, at that time, that are glorified bodies in which we encounter the full glory of the face of God, the vision of God. And we are transformed into his likeness. So the goal of the Exodus is, is worship. Okay. Um, any comments or questions there? I think we'll maybe... maybe about stop there. I've, I've got some notes finally on, on, on the Exodus as, as the paradigm or, or the pattern for God's saving activity and, and uh, that's, that's just trying to highlight the fact that uh, the pattern that you see operating here, it, it's actually happened before this in Genesis, the experience of Abraham. Uh, we'll see it 
in some of the other books of the Old Testament. Uh, but of course, um, throughout the Old Testament, it's really in, in the books of the prophets. Uh, the prophets begin to, to speak about a new exodus for Israel once they're scattered in Babylon and across the face of the known earth at that time. Uh, one, of the, one of the greatest um, intensities of, of, of that is found in the book of Isaiah from chapter 40 onwards. And um, commentators often talk about the new exodus that uh, Isaiah speaks of. And of course, at one level it's talking about what happened, the return of Israel to the promised land. They returned in 538 BC, or they began to, to return at that time. But if you know the way the Gospels, every single one of the Gospels, the four Gospels all start with, uh, well, Matthew and Luke have the, the, the prelude, but uh, when, they, when John the Baptist comes on the scene, uh, it's all Isaiah 40. So the Gospel writers understand that Isaiah 40 has been fulfilled in the coming of Jesus. So the new Exodus has been fulfilled in the coming of Jesus. And uh, Luke tells us as much in his account of the transfiguration. Luke 9 verse 1. You remember um, how Moses comes into that vision. The, the disciples see Jesus and he meets with Moses. He meets with Elijah. And Moses and Elijah and Jesus are speaking about Jesus' departure which he is about to bring to fulfillment in Jerusalem. Um, and the Greek word at that point that's translated as departed won't surprise you that it's Exodus. What Moses is talking about with Jesus is the greater Exodus that Jesus is going to accomplish. What Elijah, as the great prophetic figure of the Old Testament, is talking about with Jesus is what the whole of the prophets were, uh, were looking forward to, the new exodus that was going to happen in and through Jesus. So yes, uh, Jesus, they're talking about his departure, the fact that he's not going to be long in this world. Uh, he's going to depart this world through his death and resurrection and ascension. But in that process of moving through his death and res uh, resurrection and ascension, of course, he brings about the great exodus. That the Old Testament exodus and every other exodus looks forward to. Uh, the one that we already have a part in. Uh, the exodus whereby he secured a release. The release of all his people for all time and all nations of the earth because he will take his people from all the nations of the earth at last. Uh, and even on that day himself when he died, when he departed this life, uh, that day he took as a kind of first fruits of the harvest, he took one of the people who was closest to him at the resurrection home to paradise. Did he not? Today you shall be with me in paradise. What is paradise? Well, it's the fulfillment of the promise of the promised land. It's the gold which God is taking uh, his people through the exodus, through the redemption. So he takes him home to paradise. What a transformation that man experienced when he was hammered into the cross that day, he was a servant of Satan. And by the time he died before the sun went down that day, that man was with the spirit of Jesus in paradise. And he had discovered uh, that the master that he now served was of a totally different order from the one he had served the whole of his life up until almost his final breath. But what a great God we have that uh, 
even at the last moment, uh, he takes somebody from the depth of the pit to the highest height of heaven and glory. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that uh, in the story of the Exodus, we, you reveal to us something of your own heart. And we see that it's a heart that is pumping with love and that is committed to uh, the redemption, the liberation of your people from every nation under heaven. Father, we thank you for the exodus that we already have a part in. Help us to live as liberated people in your service in the service of our fellow human beings, our desire is that they too might come on this journey with us towards uh, paradise, towards the city of God, towards the new heavens and the new earth. Father, we bless you for that work begun in us. We bless you that uh, you will complete the work begun. Our confidence today is not in ourselves, but our confidence is in you, the only one who can do this for us, the God who has caused it to happen, the God who will cause it to continue, the God who will bring it to completion at last. Enthuse us, inspire us, fill us with your spirit, so that we might speak this word to others that they too might experience the exodus. Through Christ our Lord we ask it. Amen. Amen.